have you ever wondered why uh, mass shootings occur and what we as a society can do to prevent them? This question has likely crossed your mind more than once. Mass shootings are a terrifying phenomenon, a social dysfunction that shakes us to our core. They leave us grappling with fear, confusion, and a profound sense of loss. They're actions of individuals seeking to make the ultimate statement to impose maximum pain and heartache upon the public. Yet these actions only serve to make the perpetrators infamous, not famous. And it's this infamy that fuels the trend. The question then becomes, how do we combat this? How do we protect ourselves and our loved ones from such atrocities? The answers are not simple, but they are necessary. Now, let's delve into a personal perspective on this matter from Daniel W. Shrigley. And Daniel W. Shrigley sees mass shootings as a social dysfunction, a tragic symptom of individuals seeking a twisted form of notoriety through the infliction of pain and suffering. He sees these acts as a trend, one that has made perpetrators infamous rather than famous. This infamy, he believes, is a twisted reward that motivates these individuals to commit such heinous crimes. Shrigley's uh, perspective on this issue is rooted in the belief that the only way to combat this growing trend is by empowering law-abiding citizens with the ability to self-defend against these perpetrators. He asserts that by leveling the playing field, we can deter those who might consider such horrific actions. In Shrigley's view, uh, this is not about promoting violence, but about promoting a sense of security and empowerment among the innocent. He believes that when law-abiding citizens are able to carry firearms, either openly or concealed, it creates a deterrent for potential aggressors, making them think twice before acting. Shrigley firmly opposes the idea of the government taking away firearms from citizens. He argues that doing so will only create a certainty of victimization of the innocent. He believes that disarming law-abiding citizens will not only leave them vulnerable, but will also embolden those who seek to cause harm, knowing that their potential victims are defenseless. He cautions that taking guns away from citizens will only serve to push these dysfunctional aggressors to resort to other, potentially more dangerous forms of attack. He asserts that no government can feasibly confiscate every weapon in a country and that attempts to do so will only serve to create an illusion of safety while in reality leaving citizens even more vulnerable in daniel's opinion the government taking away firearms from citizens will only create a certainty of victimization of the innocent it's a perspective that challenges us to think critically about the balance between safety freedom and the right to self-defense it's an opinion that like it or not demands our attention in this ongoing debate um, let's consider the uh, potential impact of gun control. According to Daniel W. Shrigley, the idea of government seizing firearms from citizens presents a significant risk. If law-abiding citizens are stripped of their right to bear arms, it leaves a vacuum that could be filled by those with ill intentions. Imagine a society where the only people with access to weapons are those who operate outside the law. In such a scenario, those who abide by the rules are left defenseless at the mercy of these individuals. Shrigley argues that taking away guns simply empowers the dysfunctional aggressors, placing them in a position to resort to even more dangerous forms of attack. This could mean anything from knife attacks to car bombings or even more 
horrifying forms of violence. You see, the government can't confiscate every weapon in a country. It's a Herculean task, one that's nigh impossible. And even in the unlikely event that they succeed, it doesn't stop the production or import of illegal weapons or the potential for individuals to resort to alternative forms of violence. But let's take a step back and think about this. Why do we have guns in the first place? For many, it's about uh, self-defense. It's about being able to protect oneself and one's family in the face of danger. It's about having a fighting chance when the worst happens. And that's where we run into the crux of the problem. Law enforcement is an essential part of our society, but they can't be everywhere at once. They're often uh, the responders arriving after the incident has taken place. They're not a preventative measure. So where does that leave us as citizens? According to Shrigley, it leaves us with the need and the right to self-defense, the ability to protect ourselves, our families, and our communities. In the end, gun control isn't just about guns. It's about uh, power, it's about control, and it's about who has the ability to defend themselves. According to Shrigley, law enforcement cannot be everywhere at once, and people must have the ability to self-defend. Um, for instance, let's take a look at the situation in uh, California, a state known for its uh, stringent gun laws. California is uh, a place where the average law-abiding citizen faces significant hurdles in obtaining permits for uh, concealed or exposed firearms. The bureaucratic red tape is nearly insurmountable, leaving most folks without the means to defend themselves should the need arise. The government body in California overseeing security guards, private patrol operators, and private investigators is the Bureau of Security and Investigative Services, or BSIS for short. This organization does allow security guards to obtain permits for exposed firearms. However, for the everyday citizen who wishes to carry a concealed firearm, the process is much more um, convoluted and uh, biased. In order to uh, obtain a concealed firearm permit, one must go through the uh, elected county sheriff's department, which holds the authority to approve or deny these permits. Unfortunately, this process often results in a bias towards denial, leaving many law-abiding Californians without the ability to self-defend. Now, it's important to remember that these laws are put in place with the intention of reducing gun violence. However, according to Daniel Shrigley, they may unintentionally do the opposite. By disarming the citizens, we're creating a society where the innocent are unable to protect themselves against extreme uh, aggressors. This situation uh, Shrigley believes contributes to a rather grim reality. The epidemic of mass shootings and other violent crimes goes unhindered by the innocent who lack the means to defend themselves. This leaves the public vulnerable to the whims of criminals and extreme aggressors who don't play by the rules. In Shrigley's view, the inability of citizens to defend themselves contributes to the epidemic of mass shootings and other deadly crimes. It's a chilling thought, isn't it? That the very laws designed to protect us might be leaving us more exposed to danger. This is a complex issue, and it's clear there are no easy answers. But one thing's for certain, the conversation around gun control and self-defense needs to continue. Uh, so uh, um, what is the solution according to uh, Shrigley, you might ask? Well, uh, Shrigley's viewpoint is deeply rooted in the principle of self-defense. He believes that the power to protect oneself and others is a fundamental right and an essential deterrent against mass shootings and other acts of violence. Shrigley asserts that the capacity to self-defend should not be underestimated or overlooked. 
This is especially true in a world where the law enforcement cannot be omnipresent and response times can often mean the difference between life and death. He argues that by equipping law-abiding citizens with the means to defend themselves, we can create a more balanced environment where potential aggressors might think twice before acting. Shrigley raises a thought-provoking point isn't it better to be prepared than to be caught off guard? Isn't it wiser to be equipped to protect yourself and your loved ones rather than be defenseless against those who wish to cause harm? It's not about promoting violence, but rather about ensuring the safety and security of the innocent. However, Shrigley isn't advocating for a reckless proliferation of firearms. His emphasis is on responsible gun ownership, which includes appropriate training, mental and emotional stability, and a clear understanding of the law. He believes that a well-trained law-abiding citizen with a firearm can be a strong deterrent to violent crime. Shrigley's perspective is not about fear, but about empowerment. It's about giving citizens the tools they need to protect themselves and their communities. It's about recognizing that while we can't predict or prevent every act of violence, we can prepare and protect ourselves to the best of our ability. In a world where danger can strike at any moment, Shrigley believes that the right to self-defense is not just a constitutional right, but a human right. He asserts that a society where people are equipped to protect themselves is not only safer, but also more balanced and just. In essence, Shrigley advocates for the right and ability of citizens to protect themselves, and in doing so, he puts forward a compelling argument for the importance of self-defense in today's world. And what, or what could the future hold if gun control measures continue to increase? This question may sound ominous, but it's a reality we must confront. Daniel Shrigley, a voice of reason in the contentious debate around mass shootings and um, gun control, paints a somber picture of what could transpire if the right to bear arms is drastically curtailed. Shrigley posits that if guns are taken away from law-abiding citizens, the consequences could be far graver than the current situation. The absence of guns doesn't mean the absence of violence. Instead, it could potentially lead to a shift in the type of violence perpetrated. Imagine a world where car bombs replace gunshots, a world where personal explosive devices like those used by suicide bombers become the weapon of choice for those intent on causing harm. This is not a dystopian novel plot, but a potential reality if guns are removed from the equation. Shrigley suggests that the removal of guns could also lead to an increase in other forms of violence, such as roadside bombs and vehicular attacks in public spaces. These are all methods of violence that are difficult to predict and even harder to prevent. Unlike gun violence, where potential signs and red flags can sometimes be identified in advance, it's a sobering thought. The idea that taking away one form of potential harm could lead to the rise of others, arguably more terrifying and unpredictable. This is the future that Shrigley warns us about, a future where we haven't eradicated violence but merely changed its form, potentially making it even more deadly and destructive. This isn't a call for inaction, but rather a call for thoughtful action. It's a plea to consider the full implications of our decisions, to weigh the potential consequences, and to understand that there might be unintended side effects to well-intentioned actions. This, according to Shrigley, could be the grim reality if the right to self-defense is taken away. It's a chilling prediction, but one we must heed if we are to engage in a comprehensive, nuanced debate about gun control and 
the broader issue of violence in our society. And let's quickly recap the main points made in this video. Daniel W. Shrigley views mass shootings as tragic acts of social dysfunction, where the perpetrators seek maximum harm and notoriety. In Shrigley's opinion, these atrocities are not simply isolated incidents, but a disturbing trend that threatens the safety and security of the public at large. Shrigley firmly believes that the solution lies in equalizing the ability to self-defend. He argues that law-abiding citizens should be allowed to carry firearms, both openly and concealed. He contends that government efforts to confiscate firearms would only leave innocent people more vulnerable to attacks as it would not be possible to seize every weapon in a country. Furthermore, he emphasizes that not every potential attacker shows signs of their intentions, making preventive measures unreliable. Using California as an example, Shrigley underlines the difficulty for average law-abiding citizens to obtain concealed or exposed firearms permits. He points out that the authority to issue these permits lies with the elected county sheriff's department, which, in his view, can be biased in their approvals. Thus, he argues, many citizens are left without the means to defend themselves, leaving them vulnerable to mass shootings and other serious crimes. Looking towards the future, Shrigley warns of the potential escalation in violence if guns are taken away. He anticipates a shift towards even more lethal methods of attack, such as car bombs, suicide bombers, um, and vehicular assaults in public places. He implores the public to stand together against gun control, citing the need for self-defense as a key deterrent against these horrific crimes. In conclusion, Shrigley's perspective emphasizes the importance of self-defense and the perceived dangers of gun control. He calls for a balance between public safety and individual rights, cautioning against a future where the innocent are left defenseless. Remember, the ability to protect oneself and others is, according to Shrigley, a fundamental right that should not be taken away.